So we're going to open up now to questions and exchange of ideas. Uh, Mika, would you like to start with addressing the survey, please? Yeah, sure, everyone. So um, there have been a couple of links that I've posted in the chat, um, and I'll go ahead and post um, the pertinent one right now. Um, you guys can go ahead and fill this out. Um, if you can do so, that'd be great because it's actually going to uh, populate something that I'm going to send out again at the very end of the workshop. Um, if you're having difficulties filling it out, it's totally fine. You can do it on your own time. There was an email sent out earlier um, with the specific questions and with the links. Um, so the people who are physically there should be able to access it right now through their smart devices. Um, and if not, um, then I believe that there are hard copies available as well. Um, but that's about it. Yeah. So I think what, but for those of you who are here in the room, um, if you can't access the online link, if you just want to add to the paper that you have, um, answering these questions, to what extent do you feel like you're already doing peace engineering? How valuable can the peace engineering initiative be um, going forward to your work? And then we'll also talk about one other interesting things. But those two questions, um, think about uh, adding, if you can't do it online after the paper. So I think we're gonna jump now to the first question on here, on this survey though, um, and the, the discussion, right? Is we asked you to be thinking about this and filling it in the survey so you're ready to talk about it now and have a discussion. And the first one is, what excites you about working together under the Peace Engineering Initiative to advance our respective programs. So being part of the whole, right? Luis, you have your hand raised. Yes, Ramiro, it, it, it should come as no surprise. What really excites me is the possibility that at universities such as our own, um, the uh, deans of the engineering school, the business school, uh, and some of the other schools might actually break bread with each other monthly to talk about peace engineering. And if you want, um, I'll treat for the first meal so, because it's so unusual for those deans to talk to each other without fighting over um, potential donors. Um, I think it's a new way for them to talk and find common cause with each other and present a much more holistic view to potential donors, including uh, government grant makers, for why uh, the entire university is marshalling its resources. And, and I will put a plug in for Stanford. Stanford's announced that it's creating a, a school for sustainability. Um, but, but that's not the same as peace engineering. And, and I think we, you know, by exploring all the different silos on campus and breaking them down, as Ramiro's apt to say, uh, we're gonna get there faster. And, and the students expect us to do that. So let's do it. So first I have a question for you on that. When you're saying you're excited about the deans getting together, um, are you talking about just within Stanford? Or are you thinking that they might get together or, you know, between uh, you know, the different deans, so maybe that's too much to hope for, but the different deans getting together at Stanford, um, but the different schools within Stanford, but did you also mean like maybe the different universities outside of other deans, other universities? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think it's incumbent on these deans. So, so is that part of what the Federation is doing? Um, and, and that there's already an opportunity for doing that. Is that yes, that's so that's the engineering schools, right? So, you, so maybe Bruce, what you're suggesting is expanding that federation. You know, hosting something that includes deans from the business school and deans from the other schools. That's the point that Bruce is trying to yeah. make. So we have the Global Engineering Deans Council, and they're they're talking about peace engineering and other uh, about engineering types of related topics. But now we want to open up and start connecting other areas. We said at the beginning, social, techno, policy, finance, we all need to work together now. And this is the this is part of the conversation we will have in November at the uh, annual conference, which is in Madrid. And this is the topic that we'll be presenting with Bruce and other people. Too. Yeah, let me give an example. I mean, to my knowledge, there's a directorate at the NSF for economics, and there's a directorate for uh, for engineering, and then other, obviously, other directorates. Don't we see, after COVID, that engineering a supply chain for, you know, 
healthcare and and other issues is conver convergent and so letting everybody have their uh, the safety zone of their uh, cadre of of uh, usual suspect funders isn't going to get us where we need to go and everybody's going to have to share and come up with actually much more multidisciplinary approaches uh, such that the markets, as, as you heard in my talk, can take notice of the science and the engineering progress that is being made. The scientists have been right unto themselves for so long, but the, the, the financial you know, fund managers aren't on the bandwagon in, in the full force that they need to be. So we, we need a lot more convergencies and interdependencies on campus and as you say, between the campuses. Is there a question back here? No, I just want to make a remark to about what excites me about working together under the Peace Engineering Initiative. And uh, my name is Brian. I'm a student here at UNM. I'm a senior. I work with Dr. Jordan Romero. We, we actually started an organization. It's the Peace Engineering and Technology Entrepreneurship. What we're doing is we're trying to bring uh, intellectual computer and all their disciplinary the disciplines of engineering together to, um, you know, and, and also business students to start creating these little, you know, devices and businesses and startup for peace engineering, it's specifically what we are creating here. So, um, Bruce, some of the stuff he said was very exciting to me because uh, I have my head stuck in textbooks all day long. And I never, you know, in a former life, I had my series seven, I know a little bit about finance, but. Um, I know that what Bruce is talking about was super important for us, and I am currently looking for funding for a for a project digital design uh, microgrid with a team of seniors that we're going to try to send to Sudan right now. So we're we're doing this, and we need help. And so all you guys who are here listening, uh, reach out to us and help us because we need money, we need help, we need support. And if you guys are really here to be here and start pushing this. It's, it's, it's time to stop talking. It's time to start acting. So we're here. There's an opportunity for you to help students right now make an impact. And if you want to be that person who, who helps and, and steps up the plate, uh, rather than just be the person who talks about it, now's the time. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Go ahead. So, Introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Steve Wolf. I'm, I'm uh, one of the people that are involved and have been involved in this program for approximately three years now, right? Uh, I'm from the management school. I'm the uh, New Mexico Endowed Care for Economic Development. Uh, uh, I'm, I work with both the Dean of the Engineering and the Management School. We held two uh, of these efforts last year. Uh, we, we go back and forth with Romero to to hold these things. So, Bruce, there's been an awful lot of interaction between the deans of the management school and engineering school, uh, at least at UNM. And uh, I'm also the director of entrepreneurship, uh, as Yorgos is the co director, and, and we work here together. I don't, is so it's something, you know, and uh, we also put out a, uh, uh, Yorgos was able to. Do the thought leadership in the in with an exceptional journal that took a look at peace engineering and innovation, the innovation piece being the key for the management side. So that's how you include innovation and management because use it doesn't mean technology change. Uh, I'm both an engineer and a manager, and probably my management professors think I'm a pretty good engineer for a manager and my engineering friends and we're pretty good manager for an engineer so so i don't you know so but the idea is i'm in between this and uh, uh there is a lot of effort on doing this uh, and working in the area of Bruce, and uh, i'm sure that uh, uh, there could be more and we work well with uh, the national labs and we work well with uh, a number of other agencies, and it usually works well when we work together. Thank, Thank you. you. Is there any more online um, 
that haven't spoken up yet, I'm looking for any additional mm -hmm. hands. Go ahead, Emil. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much. I, uh, what excites me about this program, as I talked to uh, uh, Romero years back, is that it fits very nicely in our broad definition, comprehensive definition of global, national, and human security. And this broad definition ranges all the way from directed energy and cyber to food resources and water security and energy security and everything in between. So it seems to me that if uh, the peace engineering program adopts this notion of human security and community safety, then you are really democratizing the whole enterprise by engaging communities. And I think this is what, what will contribute to this program, to the success of this program and to the acquisition of grants because recently, even our government agencies have told us they would like to see grants that involve community involvement in addition to the traditional definition of global and national security. So I think if you add that element clearly up front, human security to the program, that will really tie you in with all these programs in this area. Thank you, Emil. Um, let's let's take a couple more. Any others in the room, Rob? Before we move to the next question. Sure. Uh, I want to endorse Emil's comment on the second question of what specific topical areas would I be interested in applying for funding. Um, I do think there is big opportunity in the climate space. The administration has declared its intent to spend in the order of, on the order of trillions. Um, on climate change. And 40% of that is meant to go to communities most affected by climate change and personally disadvantaged. So I think there will be uh, money flowing, substantial money flowing in that direction. And this construct, I think, would be an excellent way to get at that. What I would suggest is some sort of working group from the lab, the university, perhaps other partners. To one, share information with another funding opportunity. To a big degree, your collaboration makes the most sense. Pick a few specific targets. Uh, on the point of collaboration, I want to share that there's something else called the Northern, I believe it's the Northern Rio Grande Alliance. I don't remember the exact name, but it's basically Los Alamos, Sandia, Vietnam, Mexico State, Utah a few other entities, and that might be a natural um, venue in which to expand this conversation a bit. I leveraged some of the she meeting that Jim Chavez is organizing that, and Aviza is involved, you've got the lab director, so you've got, and you've got Heather Wilson, et cetera, so you've got a good, well-plugged-in leadership cadre so that would be a suggestion. And then lastly, topical areas. So uh, I'm informed here. One that occurred to me, especially after hearing the presentation about Sudan, and uh, I understand the other context here, uh, is sustaining and protecting democratic institutions at home and abroad. And I see that as a potentially edgy topic because it could have the result of sort of politicizing the activity. So the leadership here would have to consider that carefully. But are there engineering means to help secure democratic institutions or contribute to that in some way? Is that a broad theme that's distinct from the others that have been articulated? So that would be distinct from climate. Yes. Climate yeah. It's an additional topic. That, okay, that's great. Yeah. That, that, that's a really great um, Challenge, I think, especially, to, I don't know if Joe Hughes is still on, but um, to actually the university is really focused on some aspects of the defense um, interest in, um, in, in those kinds of settings. So, so they are, I'm sure, you can think about that. So, George so, Mason so, University. Yeah, George Mason, that's right. And George Mason University is on. Are there other people online again?
Oh, okay, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Uh -huh. Monty Abbas, I'm a professor of civil engineering at Virginia Tech. I'm also the chair of the um, Association of Sudanese American Professors in America. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to build on that uh, latest point, protecting and sustaining the democracies. I just wanted to say that, of course, as a Sudanese American, I'm very much affected by this. But I'm also looking at you know, maybe it's an opportunity to, to use our knowledge as engineers and computer scientists and all the machine learning, deep learning, uh, multi-agent system, all of those kind of things to look at the history, uh, the data that uh, has been all around us. Uh, one thing that I noticed that we do wrongly uh, in, in Sudan in particular, every time we start from the beginning. Um, whereas all, all this data and all this past, maybe we can learn from it, just applying that engineering aspect to it. Thank you. So, so I think what I'm hearing you say is using, using more advanced methods of data analytics. I know that um, you're trying to look for some of the causal um, aspects of, of ongoing re recurrent conflict is something that's been studied many years, it's actually what I did my, dis my PhD dissertation on, but we have more and more sophisticated methods for data gathering and, and data analytics. Is that, uh, I think, along the lines of what you're suggesting, Mami? That's, that's correct. Looking at the resilience of systems, looking at the sustainability of democracy and protecting it, yeah. but not only from the uh, qualitative kind of methods and analysis, but more of quantitative methods. Quantitative, right, right. And you, you just said something that I think is really interesting is, is that a lot of the work, um, it's, it's much easier to measure when things go wrong. And so a lot of the, the work has been around, you know, what, what is it that goes wrong, but being able to come up with metrics for what is working and which are the systems that are actually sustaining democratic and, and, and are able to support these democratic institutions. So, so thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so in that context, uh, were, were there any kind of warning signs that a coup may happen in Sudan and that analysis could help in that so that it could be prevented before it happens? Yeah, I mean, looking at uh, the military regime and what they were doing and the signs that they they pretending there are some coups happening just to see the responses and um, uh, and and then you know the following up with it. So there's uh, probably a buildup of some yeah. uh, factors. Yeah. That's that, why he said that if you yeah. early yeah. notice that yeah. and confirm that in the case of the government, right. maybe it could have been prevented. And I think some of these ideas that we've been talking about, like the crowdsourcing. You know, but I'm 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 thinking more of. Sorry to interrupt. Um, about building the whole environment in such a way that it is robust and resilient to these kind of coups to prevent them from happening, to start with. And, and, and you're saying specifically using some of the data analytic techniques to look at that, because these, exactly. that, that's not a new question, what makes a robust system, but using some more data um, data gathering and data analytics for that. Correct. Along, along that line, just going after you, um, after the presentation, your question, I want to bring to your attention the work that is being done by the Peace Tech Lab in Washington, D.C. Uh, Peace Tech Lab and the co-chair of the Peace Tech Lab, where over the years they have looked at uh, what they call hate speech, where you map hate speech essentially through the media, through the social media. And there are several reports that have been published in the state company. So the idea is that before Kenya came along and they had elections last time, they were looking at the hotspots. So with the hotspots through web, radio, email, or whatever, you, you could identify places where likely some insurrection would take place or voting would be corrupt or whatsoever. So I, I urge you to look at that because there's a great scientific work that was done to the Peace Tech Lab on this on, on that. On that note, Peace Tech Lab is launching a new initiative on misinformation and disinformation. That has not been discussed this morning because it is actually undermining all the efforts that we are doing on the planet, whether it is climate change, public protection, environmental protection, and so on. What's the truth? But there are some entities on this planet, and we know who they are, who can essentially distort the truth, but that how do we intervene? As engineers, we are intervening to solve some problems, 
But now if the problems are not presented to us with the right data or whatsoever, we are likely that there can be some unintended consequences. And who is going to suffer the most are the people who already suffer even more, right? So we have, so misinformation and disinformation, uh, there's a plan right now to create something like IPCC. IPCC is for climate. Let's have an organization worldwide that will take care of misinformation and disinformation. That's on in the making. And that work that came out of the Nobel Prize Summit that came out this year, where it was a recommendation that we need an IPCC equivalent in regard to misinformation and disinformation. Otherwise, being serious. So, Bernard, could you just, the Peace Tech Lab, for those that don't know, it's associated with the U.S. Institute of Peace. Peace Tech Lab is an offshoot of the yeah. USIB that would be from the world, yeah. um, security next to the U.S. Institute of Peace in Washington, D.C. If you don't know the USIP, you, I urge you to look into the work that they are doing. They have been doing it for a long time, 20, 25 years. It's a bipartisan, uh, it's supported by Congress, and they are looking at uh, taking essentially climate change very, very serious, especially in regard to what was mentioned in security and international security and national security. So, Look into that. Um, some interesting work being done, but the misinformation and the disinformation that we are seeing today, that's dangerous stuff. So, Sandra just rejoined us. I'm ready for questions. That's relevant to the topic right here. You know, what excites you? What do you want to work on? Or, um, uh, well, you know, I'm doing my dream job right now. So, I just really, I, I really have to, to laugh that. The initiatives right now are just so um, relevant to helping peoples and communities in need. We have all of the good technology. I think we just need the connection to people and build that trust with the communities that we serve. I know we have goodwill and we want to help, but I really do think making that re relationship stronger as to why you want to help. I mean, we know how to help. We have the tools, but I have seen examples where you come in and say, I know what to do. Here's the funny one. I'm from the government tribe. I'm here to help. Or Alaska Village, I'm here to help. It's like, uh oh, we just stepped back several decades. It's, I'm, I'm really here to help, but I want to hear what your needs are. What are your challenges? Because we could have all types of uh, scenarios or technologies that could be of support of the community's goals. And it may not be that difficult of a problem. But what I think is, is, is um, kind of keeps me up at night is that it's, a, it's the need is here. It, it has to be done quickly because climate change is affecting all of us. But in those vulnerable, com vulnerable communities, it's hitting harder and deeper. If it's a drought, if it's you no know, having no fish, if it's too much water, if it's having to move villages because the, the water is rising, that's all happening now. If it's wildfires in California, if it's um, and the, rising. And the, thank you. Yeah, I, I think I really appreciate those comments. I think we all do. I, I believe George had a specific question for you. Is that right, George? Sure. Yeah, so thank you. So, so Sandra, it's good to see you. I mean, I've loved interacting and appreciated your perspectives over so many years. Um, the, the thing that I, I just feel like you can help us see is you, you spoke to this. It's like goodwill, but from outside can, can actually set us back. And, and yet we have, you know, the wolf is at the door, if you will, in terms of some of these situations. And is there a pathway that you would recommend in terms of finding the people, you know, the communities that have folks inside that have trusting relationships with people outside that would be logical pathways that we could kind of let's let's explore this where we don't have to build the relationships. We figure out how we can work in this, this hybrid inside outside kind of way. And then how do we build relationships where we don't have them already? I think the, the goodwill is the starting point. You have to have that. Otherwise, you know, there's there's other problems that you can um, take on, right? We, we have a whole society full of challenges, but the goodwill is great. That That's a starting point. 
I think trying to get to know those who've, who've made some strides with projects that could be from the technical side, the national lab side, or the tribes themselves. So one resource I think if you're very interested in Indian country is look at the Department of Energy's Indian Energy website and they have projects going back, I'm gonna say at least 10, 12 years. And it has a snapshot of where that tribe is, what they've been working on. Most times there's a point of contact and that would be a good starting point. So if your technology is dealing with solar, look at the California tribes, you know, it, it's logical for that. If you're looking at maybe more forest type of uh, micro, uh, biomass, look at the tribes that have a lot of forest and they're leading some of the initiatives for carbon credits with their forest. Monomany tribe up in Wisconsin, I mean, they've had hundreds of years taking care of their forests. It's so pristine. You can see it from the aerial satellite views. Some of that is sort of the homework you have to do to see what resource they may have, but the will of the people may be reflected in a project they've already done or maybe what they wanna do next. So one of the things at Sandia we're looking at specifically is those tribes that have put in a, a solar system per se, the next stage they may wanna be is microgrids. There's, a, there's a, a leg up because they have some of that hardware in place and then you wanna add storage well, we might have programmatic means to help them. The others through partnerships. I'll just give you an example. There's a great um, um, industry partner called Grid Alternatives, and their approach has really been successful. They'll come in with the hardware and they'll actually do the teaching of the tribal members to put up the solar panels, either on homes or community installations. So there's some great private partners out there that you could see from Indian Energy's website that might be a start to say, here's, here's some success you built on. Now, I have some ideas that could enhance what you're already doing rather than starting from scratch. Always look at how do you enhance what's being done. Yeah, absolutely. It's like asset-based development, focusing on what you have instead of what you don't have. Okay. Uh, and you think that from a trust perspective, if we, like if I contacted someone that I didn't know, but I'd done the due diligence to kind of research what I could find on the web, through the Office of Indian Energy or other publications, that would help mitigate or overcome that, that thing that you said, like, hey, I'm from the government, I'm here to help, because I am from the government, and I am here to help. Right. But it would keep the wrong interpretation of that uh, at distance. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. I'm gonna jump in here. I'm gonna connect a couple of dots. It's a, related to trust. This is something that we started early on three years ago to discuss about trust. How do you trust? Because fake news travel a lot, lot faster than trust and there's no peer review, right? So going back to what Bernard's saying and what you brought in Monty, I mean, democracies and all that. I've been working many, many years in Colombia. After 50 years, they know how to measure peace and they have to build trust. So they have developed methodologies they know how to get the data, collect the data, process the data. They brought it down. They don't have the supercomputers, but they brought it down to FPGAs and they can model. Say what FPGAs are. Field programmer in race. It's hard work. Yeah. And they don't know what FPGA means. The field program gives it right. Doesn't mean anything. Yeah, <laughs> it's just a fancy computer anyway. It's very digital. But they have they're measuring. Anger, trust. Um, uh, I, I mean, I have a whole list of all these value systems that I've been collecting because after 50 years, how do you build trust, right? And so this is something that we discussed early on in the Peace Engineering Consortium. Come up with a situation, awareness maps, like weather prediction, so you can see the flags when things are going to collapse. This is what Sudan, and this is Latin America. Every time, well, now we call it elections, but when we have elections, we have to start from scratch. It's, it's, it's a different coup, but so we need the situation awareness map, and then we started working on the peace data standard to collect all that. So this is, we're talking complex systems here, and this is why we put in one of the themes here, complex systems and system thinking, because it can be applied to weather prediction, to come up, look at the signals of something is 
and stability issues. And I think this is a great area for us to do. And this is something engineers can contribute to social sciences. And we have in our dental phase. This is what Colombians are using. So why can't we use it? So I think this is a great topic. So I'm going to jump in here, though, and um, throw a little monkey wrench. Maybe, maybe not. Um, the second part of this question is, um, who, what are the near-term, let's see, uh, applying for funding, and who are the potential sponsors? So Rob stood up and told us very specifically, you know, we're going to get 40% of the funding, and we got this, you know, trillion dollars from the federal government, and 40% is going to go to the community. Um, we can, there's a lot of potential areas to apply peace engineering to, to really get some traction. We, we want to not just identify interesting problems, but to Bruce's point, where, where are there some that we can, in the near term, point to some very specific value propositions that, that, that people are already interested in putting money behind? And so, um, this is great, but I, I've been in this field a long time, and I'm not thinking right away of, of sponsors that are like ready to shell out money. Bankers, that, bankers. You know, and so, so, that's, so that's that's the question. You know, are there potential sponsors for that kind of work? And just you know, so, so some thoughts from either here in the room or online um, around so this is you know around technologies to build trust and to mitigate misinformation. I just. I'm not sort of like blanking on it, I'm just asking to address the rest of that question. Like, like are there potential sponsors for that? And who are they? Let's bring that. Nancy, can I take a stab at it? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this is this is Camille Agui. I run uh, Sensorcom Technologies. Um, what we do is we're an IoT company. Uh, we were we started in the transportation space. And if we can deal with sort of please don't tweet this, but uh, during COVID, when everybody stopped driving. I panicked and we moved and pivoted into the healthcare space. So we were doing sort of tailpipe emissions. Now we do uh, COVID monitoring at the wrist. And then we are actually looking at generating new sensors for methane. So that's kind of the core business of what I'm dealing with. And one of the challenges, and, and this is kind of going to bookend what uh, Joe Hughes was saying this morning, is that Nobody wants to fund peace engineering because nobody understands it. Now, we got funded for peace engineering through one of our disadvantaged community programs uh, that we got funded by the California Energy Commission. And the only reason they funded peace engineering was because it was climate change. Um, so we said, look, you know, climate change is part of peace engineering. And of course, everybody's scratching their head going, what is peace engineering? So there's a branding problem to start. Um, so so what we've been doing is kind of talking work and trying to talk about this and kind of translating the information, right? So how do you translate peace engineering to something a banker understands or a venture capital understands or a NSF program manager understands? And so when we try and do that, what happens is that, you know, we're starting to build a little bit more awareness. Now, it helps that Sandy is involved. It helps that Los Alamos is involved because now it brings sort of zero order credibility. Whereas if Centricom comes in and says, hey, you know what, we're in the peace engineering game, um, they usually get the sort of head scratch and so what? Um, so I think, you know, the, the sponsors are going to be the groups that can look at a particular project, be able to tie it together and then have it become uh, sort of fundable. The other side of this is that we were also looking at the policy side. So we spent a, about a year uh, trying to enable uh, the local political groups to be able to participate and get line items in budgets. So we, we had gone down that road too. But all of these are just, you know, unfortunately, as, um, you know, as, as an entrepreneur, I don't remember when I, if I ever stopped raising money, I think we're always in the money raising game. Um, and I think this is going to have to be the same thing where we're just going to have to get super aggressive with it. Bruce, you had your hand up. Yeah, I, you know, piggybacking on Camille's um, thinking, I, I, there is an explosion 
of ESG, Environmental Social Governance, CSR, Corporate Social Responsibility, SRI, uh, Impact Assessment, uh, supposedly funds and investment vehicles that are coming about. I expect I'll see SPACs and other kinds of nonsense. Um, ultimately, the regulators, as I mentioned in my talk, are very concerned that there's not the transparency of accountability to see where does the money sit tonight doing what it what the fund managers uh, accumulated the funds to do. And so it would behoove us to bring some of our grad students to the DOE and to the Biden administration and say, and the U.S. Treasury and the SEC and the um, other regulators, the CFTC, Commodities Futures Trading Commission, we need to map the flow of money into those funds to see if they're doing uh, what they say they would do, whether it's by a periodic table or whatever, such and, and in the end, without telling people they were doing peace engineering finance, we will make them do peace engineering finance. So much like uh, you got your kids to eat green, they'll kind of eat green. But it's okay. They don't need to be bothered by the specifics of it. And, and so um, let us do what we do, which is it's a data management problem. In this case, it's the data on how funds are flowing and what tags or meta tags are being attached to them and whether they're actually doing what they say they're doing and informing the regulators that they, that they won't be able to regulate a fund designated ESG, et cetera, without the work that we're talking about doing. And then, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to yeah. jump on that and add a, a thought um, to get please, it on the record please. for a technology kind of solution. Um, it's, it's going, that, that same philosophy applies internationally. So when we're talking about going back to the idea of what supports democratic institutions, the transparency of funds, especially coming into fragile states and being able to track the money's being, you know, not only that it's going to where it's supposed to go, but fit to have metrics for it. Is, um, a technology that we don't have um, and, and you know, at the community level, tying it back to the whole idea of community level. So if you could I don't know, make that part of the record, um, that's my contribution to, 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 to build on that. I'd like to switch a little bit of the time that we have. Um, we have five minutes left. Um, we've got some great ideas about new areas to work in. I wanted to go back. So we, we, we built on the climate change, you know, climate security idea. We've, we've really jumped on um, the idea of community and community-based um, work. Was there any other thoughts or comments that were triggered by um, discussion of this, like the material sustainability, the complex modeling, the energy, the water, the cooperative monitoring? Did any additional thoughts on that? Um, uh, or did, do, do, do you get thumbs up on those? Should they be part of what we're doing? Are they, you know, not as high a priority? Just some, some thoughts, um, how to really direct and focus our efforts moving forward. If you have thoughts on that, you can put it in the survey, survey. you know, or the link online, or if you want to share them now, that would be great as well. Nancy, it's just healthcare. It's, you just, you need to add healthcare because the system apparently due to the, pan, or, you know, as the pandemic came around, the healthcare system's broken. So we got to get away from um, population health Everything has to start going into personalized medicine, right? I don't understand at, at 6, 3, 2, 10, why two aspirin is as good for me as two aspirin is good for my mother, who is apparently 5'4", 120 pounds. Mm -hmm. So there's got to be personalized medicine and how that's going to be driving the next wave of care. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Any other thoughts? Yes, Steve. It's called the three P's medical health care and you want to follow that thread first uh, prevent prevention personalized and proactive or something like that. anyway uh exactly what he said it's going from one size fits all to one size fits one and that's in prevention and, and, uh, and you're also in control yourself 
So yeah. the Ramiro, are, are any people three. from HSC part uh, of this? Uh, the science yeah. center. Yeah. Yeah. We work with an echo group, but uh, uh, we invited Sanjeev. Sanjeev is on travel. He's very busy. Oh, no, 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 we work with him. On the echo. Yeah. And plus, Nada is Nada is also. So I think her example would be more close to people's a real live example. Turning things around on a dime once once sanctions were lifted, how they <clears throat> they were able to train so many people to go out into the communities and train. Well, we're about to Yeah, I think could we go on to the next couple of slides? I think um, if you have I keep encouraging you, if you have additional ideas, we have um, ways for you to capture those. Um, next slide. So, so what we'd also like for you to do is um, say how interested are you personally in pursuing some of these topics? So this has been going from the global, now we're talking about going down to the personal. So personal and proactive, how interested are you in pursuing X topics? So we'd like to hear you know, what you would like to personally pursue. Um, it, even if it's an idea that hasn't been talked about openly now. And then which of these topic areas would you want to join a community of interest? We really want to continue to expand and build a community of interest. Um, so, so answer those as well on the survey link and putting it down on the, the paper here. We want to get a little, uh, sense of the level of involvement that you guys can have um, beyond just today. And then the next slide. Well, we'll be able to get a copy of the chat the questions that yes. yes, yes, that's the next slide. I think the next slide, you go to the next slide, hopefully. What to expect next? There you go. So, so we're going to provide a summary of, of the workshop insights and feedback, including the chat. It might be a week or two for us to you know, give us a little time to collect it and want to analyze it and not just give you a raw data. Um, you're welcome to raw data if you want, but we also thought we'd try to do some analysis of it and get it back to you. We're trying to do that in two weeks. That, that work? Any other comments? Yeah, and also we will edit this into smaller chunks and actually provide the recordings and as well the chat. Did you have anything to add to that? Uh, uh, so we have one participant from Brazil. How international is this becoming? Like, could you use your district context probably? Yeah. I, uh, the, the, the workshop was very focused. You know, we had a we, yeah, we, we wanted to keep it in the broader sense. The broader sense. Yeah. Even, yeah. Uh, he, Jose Carlos, he was the dean of the school venture of Rizzo Sao Paulo, which mm -hmm. is number one in Latin America, right? And uh, he came to the conference, participated. He went back. They created a center for peace. Peace and conflict studies with the School of Engineering. He just created a whole new program. It's their piece of engineering program at the University of Sao Paulo, which is radiating to all the public universities in Brazil. That's an outcome of that conference. So that's why he, he see, so he always participates. Because I think, especially in the context of Europe, we don't concerned about having an international network. Very important. So, so the international network is there. I mean, that the, the conference yeah, that we mentioned in 2018 is international for all the engineering games. I think. Yeah. A very focused universities right now: Sao Paulo. We have one in Argentina, La Plata. We have uh, two in Colombia. We have one in Mexico. And yeah. Bolivia. Bolivia is in crisis. <laughs> <laughs> and there's more Kenya, <laughs> Kenya, we have yeah. in Sudan, but it's on hold. Yeah. But, that, but that's, the, that's the goal, you know. So if you have contacts, and you know, that's, that's part of what we want to do. But please put that down on your survey sheet, you know, because we build out the community interest. Who, who else should we be right? Um, that's that's the, what to expect now. So, so we have a you know, as a result of. What we hear in this workshop and online discussion, and we want to come up with a kind of a call to action to meet these goals that have been put forth by our government, by the UN. We also want to identify within the group of people here or the network you know who are some champions. If we come up with two to three things that we want to fund, some projects we want to move forward with, we have a um, your great digital who championed his work, so we want to identify champions. They carry what the, these efforts forward. Um, 
And when we say we want them to be the difference we see, we want to say, so I'm just going to write a check, but they're going to have to, you know, walk the talk and live the talk. And then the last one, which to your point, is expanding and supporting the piece and vendors. Who else can the community be engaged? But also, what kind of, who, who else will, who in this community will have time and effort to, to, to show up and to engage in the dialogue and to help us build that infrastructure? Um, so those are the, those are the things that we want to be doing next. Um, and, and we're hoping to get some sense review of how much we can do. Do you want to add to that, Romero? No, no, no. That... Any comments, questions from the Zoom group? Pilot programs. Sorry, what? Camille, what was that? Well, what? I mean, need, the need for pilot programs. Quick yeah. deployment, get in, get yeah. out, rapid That's test, yeah. throw it out. If it doesn't work, if it works, deploy. That's what that's what this call to action is. So we'd love to have you, you know, take a look at that. You know, what is it we want to do with these pilot programs? Get in and go out. How do we how do we make it happen? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Oh, Nancy, you don't want my ideas. <laughs> <laughs> they have to be workable, you know, for university. No, no, no. They'll be workable. <laughs> Plausible as I can do. <laughs> that's, 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 and Mary Monson helps us with that. So any other thoughts, closing comments from any of the participants? Bruce, you know, go ahead. Oh, yeah. yeah, just just one fast one is most of the law firms and most of the um, investment banks um, have pro bono commitments to dedicate hours to nonprofits and even universities. Great idea. It is nonprofits. Um, uh, and so why don't we ask for... Um, for them to help us assemble what I was suggesting, which is a, a continuous, a, a, almost like a web page that updates continuously of all of the funds that are being raised in different forms, um, including internationally, um, World Bank supported or otherwise, that say that they're going to do ESG and, and the SDGs. And, and then, um, map them to the under and over concentration in the periodic table sense of where they're putting too much money into one area without balancing it for the other to achieve the piece. That's that's a, that sounds like a very specific, great proposal for you to, I, to call I, I would love DOE yeah. to say to my yeah. nonprofit Urban Logic, you know, yeah. please do yes. that. The, George, the, speaking the, of DOE, I think George had a comment here. Oh. Did I hear George say, please do that, Bruce? I think I did. <laughs> <laughs> you did hear me say, please. Yes, of course you heard me always say, please. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to interject real real fast, George, I'm sorry, is is this notion of, the, and, and you touched on it, the gaps and the valleys of death. I've been doing some work with AFRL's uh, Sean Ross on readiness levels for innovation and the history of readiness levels, and particularly with regard to the tribal development of readiness levels for innovations and taking action versus um, the non-tribal senses of when things have to pro progress through not only TRLs, but the other RLs. So I think we, we need to understand how these different communities hit bottlenecks in readiness levels um, and solve them or become so dismayed that they won't solve them. And that goes to the implementation issues that we've seen with COVID, Vax, and, and, and solar and, and other areas. So research on readiness level um, affinities, I think, uh, are, are key to attract money to, to break through those bottlenecks. Thank you, Bruce. It looks like, at least for now, you get the last, the last comment. You get to wrap this up. You gonna, are you going to comment, George? No, we're wrapping up. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I personally, I like the, the pilot idea, pilot project idea. And it, it makes me feel cautious when I, I think about the whole cross-section of people that we had here, the different, some of the, the possible pilot areas are very um, disparate. I guess the, the themes, so some of the needs are there, but it'd be hard to collaborate on some of them. And so I wonder if we had like a couple sprinklings of 
maybe more regionally defined ones that a subset of us could gather around, agree on what those might be as a larger group, but then empower those folks to go off and then report back. Uh, what would you guys think about that? Yeah, I think that's that's very consistent with what uh, our ideas of what, how we want to analyze what we've heard is, is to see if we could identify what some of those groups might be um, and then form those groups, you know, and, and let them go off and work, just like you said. So if you have specific thoughts yourself about that, um, how you think some of the elements we've had here today might work together, we didn't you know, have any preconceived notion. We have five topic areas. Do these need to be pursued individually? Can we pick some subsets of two or three and, and mix and match them together to come up with some pilots? Um, we'd, we'd really love to hear from all of you. That's why these were workshops, not a presentation um, per se. We had a lot of presentations, but the work is now to get that feedback from you. Given what you've heard, what does, what, what would make sense? For some areas to combine well, some either individually, combine mall, combine two or three, some sub themes, whether they be rural, they be big cities. Um, Drexel's done work on you know how to how to how to reduce you know violence and the effect of con conflict in in mega cities, for example, and that's very different than what happens in rural communities. You know, so so what are some of the areas, and are there anything common that sprinkles across all those like conflict systems? Oh, I'm curious the same thing. Yeah. Yeah, so in terms of the complex systems, one other institution that probably should have both the center. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. Of course, yeah. They're having their annual meeting next week. Yeah. Actually, their annual annual meeting this week is this year is next week, and their theme is emergent engineering. So we've been in dialogue about that. But nobody tells us if I were to. <laughs> so we're going to wrap it up. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody, for your Thank participation. You we do look for your feedback. Please send us uh, feedback. The people here, thank you so much for coming. And uh, we'll be in touch, definitely. Thank you. Mika and uh, Donna did all the work. So thank you, Mika. Thank you, Donna. You guys did terrific. Put this together. Thank you.